This is Impressionism. Nice, isn't it? We find ourselves in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. We see miles and miles of medium-sized arrangements of delectable, charming colours. A total absence of darkness and a happy, woozy, soft-edgedness everywhere. How could anyone have ever hated this? Impressionism is the first movement of modern art. Because of its charm, we forget that Impressionism is also avant-gardism. We think Impressionism was the last time art was understandable. And then there's a succession of more and more outrageous hoaxes getting higher and higher into obscurity. And that's the modern art tradition that we're still in. But actually, this is in the same stream as this. We find the shark a bit mysterious, but we pretty much know what goes into its shock value. It's us, what we are, our society, what turns us on, what makes us react. We think this is too nice for that. What I'm going to do over the next two hours is tell the story of Impressionism partly in order to see what made this shocking in its time, but also to look at the challenge it offers to our equivalent of it. Tonight, Impressionism bites back. artists who opened the door for Impressionism are Gustav Courbet and Edouard Manet. They stand for the lead-up phase. The one quintessential Impressionist is Claude Monet. He starts up the movement. The artist who turned Impressionism into modern art is Paul Cézanne. He's the one who makes Impressionism's niceness complicated. These will be our guides for the evening. They all knew each other, they sometimes bought each other's paintings. They went to the same restaurants and encouraged each other, or gossiped and complained about each other. It's like a family in a soap opera, only instead of an oil dynasty, it's an art family with its own distinct culture. What unites them artistically is a radical idea. They think art should be real and not false. We think that too only we have certain fixed ideas about what reality is. Reality is literal and numb. An artist casts his head in his own frozen blood. Reality is politics that seem almost alien, so the alienating, sophisticated playfulness of today's political art almost makes sense. Reality now is a big confusion about beliefs, so instead of being hungry for the old moral certainties of the culture of art, its grand ambitions to tell us all how to be, we're hungry for personality, for confession, for glamorous individualism. Weirdly, the story of what Impressionism thought reality was begins with something like a Turner Prize installation. Paris, the 19th century. The first step toward Impressionism is a colossal event. The public can't miss it. It's called the Pavilion of the Real. The Pavilion of the Real was put up here in the centre of Paris in 1855, 150 years ago, by Corbet. Opposite is the biggest show of French art there's ever been. But Corbet is a rebel attacking the establishment. There's a big building full of official art, and across the road, a rebel in a tent. Here's a sketch by Corbet of how he wanted the pavilion to look. This scribble 
was to shake up art forever. Hundreds of thousands of visitors went to the Universal Exhibition, which is what the official art show was called. Here it is. And then they went to Corbet's Pavilion. What did they see? Inside it were 40 paintings he'd done over the previous seven years. Most were large, some enormous, like this one, nearly 20 feet wide. It's called the Painter's Studio. On the left are veiled portraits of government people, the Emperor Napoleon III and other high-ups in the government. The Emperor is shown as a poacher because he stole the empire. Napoleon III seized power illegally in a coup d'etat. He had his enemies executed or exiled. His government is run as a dictatorship. Corbet said these are all just commercial people, shopkeepers. They have to be disguised here because no one can openly criticize the government. No one can put themselves against the emperor. The painting is an allegory of society. Over here is where the arty people of society are. In the middle of this little crew is Proudhon, the anarchist, who said property is theft. On the left is the industrialist and art collector Bruya, whose money paid for the pavilion of the real. It's a bit narcissistic because Corbet's at the centre of it, his handsome Assyrian profile, he called it. He's definitely vain, but he's also realistic. The reason it's so big is because it's got to fight a big institution. The one that has the ultimate say over what art is. And that is the Salon of Fine Art held every year at the Louvre. Think of the Turner Prize, the Royal Academy Summer Show and the government all mixed up into a single totalizing entity. It's been going for centuries, now it answers direct to the emperor. Everything in it supports the Emperor by supporting the idea that art should not be about the reality of what's actually happening now, but what happened long ago, in an unreal, idealised, fictional time. The Salon is an institution, but it's also a state of mind. Going to it shows your social aspiration. The atmosphere of Salon art is always dead, the people are anemic, anatomically perfect, but smoothed and varnished to death. Everything is done to a formula, according to conventions which are learned by artists like recipes. The frank colour in Impressionism, the directness of the paint handling, the open, loose, rough look to the way it's done, is the opposite to the overcooked look of Salon art. You can see this kind of art reeling in horror from the Impressionist kind, the ordinary life kind, where the mundane is made special. In our time now, all visual media, high art, TV, movies, ads, whatever, start out from the mundane. They emphasize the everyday. This is our pop world today. It's a heaven of the ordinary, not a heaven of the heavenly. The human, the obvious, the down to earth, that's the stuff we elevate into art, whether it's Turner Prize art or mass media pop culture art. This is us, our own needy, human, childish, consuming selves. But in the 19th century, art was expected to transcend the everyday. Why be down in grim reality when you can be up here in the perfume clouds? Don't think about your real selves in real society, being oppressed by a real dictator. Think about your fantasy selves, off in an unreal classical theme park. As a salon favourite, you glorified the past with pageantry and teasing nudity and ancient Roman evoking. You weren't interested in reality. The real as merely immediate, raw, unfiltered life experience was not true, but merely random. Corbet thought this wasteland of the real had something, and maybe truth wasn't up in the air, but down to earth. 
He himself came from a place in the countryside that no one had ever heard of, the village of Ornan in eastern France. He came from a family of farmers. His father was a peasant who had done well and acquired land and a couple of houses. The main family home was on the side of the river that ran through the centre of the village. Here is his house. Imagine the lovely, welcoming kitchen parlour inside. How's he going to get from that rustic, charming humbleness to being accepted by the glam salon power world? He's aware of a minor salon style called realism. Eventually, Corbet will make himself the leader and the personification of the realist style, and the style's going to be huge. In fact, the word realism starts to acquire a capital R in writings about art in the 1850s directly because of Corbet. But in the meantime, the realist style is known as little, roughly done landscapes. Even though it's a style the salon doesn't take seriously, Corbet likes the ordinariness of this look. His capital R realism comes from three big enthusiasms. First, this look. Second, this look. He liked the directness of the cheap popular prints of the time. They got a message across very simply, even if they weren't art. And here comes a third enthusiasm. When he was in Paris, he lived in this street, Rue Hautefeuille, above a cafe called the Brasserie Andelaire, a notorious hangout of anarchists and bohemians. He was the centre of the crowd. Here he is in his twenties, a looker, but not yet a great artist. It's the left-wingers' talk about politics that gives Corbet that eureka moment that makes his artistic career take off. Don't you take off, though, because in a minute, Paris is going down in flames and Corbet's going to swell up to twice the size. Welcome back. Lovely impressionism, full of dappled sunlight. Nothing could be further from politics, you'd think. But how true is that? Let's go back to Paris and find out. In 1848, there was a series of left-wing rebellions all over Europe. The one in Paris was called the 1848 Commune. Like the others, it was quickly crushed, but it made an enormous impact. Corbet didn't take part in it because it was violent. 3,000 people died and he was a pacifist. But it gave him the idea that politics was important and that by being in the art world, he could be politically active. Corbet draws himself in the Brasserie Andelaire in 1848. He's thinking about bringing down the government. You can see his look as he thinks it. The others around the table saying, yeah, why not? Let's go for it. Peasant world. Once you get intellectuals and bohemians and anarchists in there too, anything can happen. Corbet started painting enormous group portraits of his own people from his own region. peasants at the end of the day returning from an agricultural fair. What does the salon audience make of this? It's not just, ooh, the charming life of peasants, a much lower class than me. They don't quite know how to gauge what it is they're being shown. For one thing, it's nine feet wide. Big peasants. The salon audience is fed up with that because peasants should be humble creatures. Corbet's heroic scale seems wrong. And what's this new handling? The paint is mashed and scraped. Corbet does a lot of it with a knife instead of a brush. It's not Impressionism yet, but it's nothing like salon painting's glassy smoothness. It's mottled and heavy. It's like the rocky, cloudy, textured, solid world that Corbet's looking at. You can't tell who's in charge. These people are grotesque, but then why isn't the mood entirely comic? Why is it thoughtful, beautiful, quiet? How can the salon audience get its emotional bearings when there's no one they can obviously look down on? The 
class of this guy is identifiable by his exaggerated get-up. He's a member of the new rising rural bourgeoisie. The salon audience might be expected to identify with him, but he's out taking his pig for a walk. What's really going on in the French countryside? What is it that the salon audience in Paris doesn't want to think about when it's thinking about art? Well, the political issues are too many people and not enough land, exploitation of poorer country people by richer people, and oppression of everyone by the government in Paris. There's misunderstandings on both sides. There's a big fear in the city of the country. They think it's all red France out here, and the right wing in the countryside think that Paris is full of anarchists. And what do people think of Corbet? He was often caricatured in the papers. They drew him as a fat peasant. In fact, he had got quite fat from his drinking, but it was Corbet's big talk they were really targeting. He was incredibly confident he'd got a great act, the Emperor recognises the power of it. Corbet is invited to join in with the Emperor's Universal Exhibition. That year, 1855, the Salon is going to be incorporated into it. The Salon director says to Corbet, but tone your stuff down. Remember, the Salon represents the government. Corbet says, it seems to me that the government is only really like a person. So in that case, I can be a government. Then he proceeds to act like one puts on the pavilion of the real. He paints the studio especially for the pavilion. It's supposed to be the key to all the other paintings. The landscape round Ornon, where Corbet comes from. He's painting a painting within a painting. The brightest light comes from that spot. Illumination comes from the thing he knows best his own region. Corbet said you should paint the truth, paint your own time from your own point of view. This was absolutely staggering to his audience, they'd never heard that one before. The audience at the time thought it was terrible and obscure and just a bloated homage to himself. But to history, it's like a sign saying, this way moderns. The artist's private reality. This is hot. The story of Corbet and politics is an up and down ride. Sometimes he's full on about socialism, sometimes he's a bit cynical. After the Pavilion of the Real, Corbet's art became less socialist, more sensationalist. By the 1860s, the political regime was too entrenched for Corbet to attack it head on. Instead of menacing the bourgeoisie with images of a world of political reality that they didn't want to face, he gave them what they wanted, nudity. Only, he did it oddly. Give them nudes, Corbet thought, but make them solid peasant types. Don't make them ethereal goddesses, make them lesbians. He painted the sources of the rivers around his hometown. The unmistakable feminine symbolism of flowing water gushing from dark caves went with the other type of imagery he was producing at the same time. His earthy nudes. Corny paintings he was mostly doing for private collectors. He didn't politicise his stuff anymore, but he did still philosophise it. As Corbet lost his mojo, politically speaking, he became a sensualist for the sake of sensuality. Truth doesn't come from convention, he knew, so it must come from within. But what is it that produces it there? 
he thought it must be nature, the cliffs and pine forests where he came from. He had a homemade philosophy of earth and rocks and water and femininity somehow equating with creativity and art and his own self. Kobe got these paintings into the official annual salons where they were seen not just by the dainty audience for art but also by the future Impressionists. The Impressionists were not interested in Corbet's metaphysical musings about where everything comes from, but they did respond to his all-over brightness and roughness. In a few years' time, based on this kind of thing, Impressionism will challenge salon sentimentality with real sensuality. Sensuality isn't just human nudity, it's the sensuality of paint, of materials, of the surface of the painting. This is what Impressionism says yes to in Courbet. On the other hand, it says no to the violence Courbet also expresses. The salon audience liked hunting scenes in the woods, but when Courbet did them, they were real, they were savage. The extra brutality is Courbet's realism. In his 1867 painting of a stag being attacked by hunting dogs, everything's violent. Even the glare of the snow is like an explosion and the dogs are like blasts in the white. Here he is painting it in a photo from the time. Only the doomed stag is in place. Meaning is about to rush in everywhere else. Today, people assume Impressionism, because it's lovely, comes from lovely times. In fact, the world was just as horrible then as it is now. In 1870, after 20 years in power, the Emperor foolishly decided to start a war with Prussia, which France quickly lost. The Emperor abdicated and a new French government was elected. It was based in Versailles, about 40 miles outside of Paris. This government surrendered to the Prussians, but Paris refused to give up, and as the next year came round, it went on refusing. It formed its own breakaway government, the Paris Commune. This was the 1871 Commune, as opposed to the 1848 one, but had the same left-wing aims, an end to exploitation, democracy, equality, and no more religion. The Prussians sieged the city. They bombarded it and cut off all supplies. The food ran out, bombs were falling, people were eating cats and dogs and rats, and then the Versailles government decided to send in the French army to break up the commune. Paris is burning. It's a civil war. What's Courbet doing down there? He's made a commune leader. He says artists will now run all art institutions. He abolishes the judges and juries at the Salon. Blimey, what on earth is he going to do next? We still don't know if it was his idea as Commissioner of Art under the Commune to pull down the Vendome Column in Place Vendome, something like Nelson's Column in Trafalgar Square. But somebody ordered it and it was assumed to be him. Enormous chunks of the column fell neatly in a line. The old order coming down. The commune reigned until the end of May, and then what became known as the Week of Blood began. Versailles troops retook Paris, street by street, massacring as they went. The communards killed about a thousand people. But the government troops killed 30,000 communards and suspected communards, men and women. They lined them up behind public buildings and in cemeteries and parks and gardens, and they executed them. They ran out of ways to do it. They ended up using Gatling guns. It was a massacre of the poor by the powerful, an incredible slaughter. It really gave anyone who wanted to ask for a bit of equality and democracy from now on a lesson in what to expect.
Corbe was arrested. Everyone knew he'd been agitating for a while for the Vendome column to be pulled down because he disagreed with its symbolism. It stood for France's military victories of the past. So he must have led the revolutionary rioters who destroyed it. No, that's wrong, Corbe claimed in his defence. And this photo really does show Corbe's actual trial. He said he'd been busy protecting artworks in the Louvre from being looted by conservative art administrators who'd been sacked by the Commune. He was given six months in prison and fined 500 francs. This doesn't seem too bad. But two years later, an even more right-wing government comes in and Corbet is retried. And this time, his punishment is to pay the full costs of reconstructing the Vendome column, which he knows will ruin him and make him a state slave for the rest of his life. He exiled himself to Switzerland and lived there. In 1877, at the age of 58, Corbet died of alcoholism. His body retained so much liquid in the months before he died that at his death, his waist measured 55 inches. That enormous body rotted in Switzerland for a hundred years before the bones were brought back here to the cemetery in Orno. Corbet gives to Impressionism rough surfaces and being against the Salon, being for truth and against lies. But you can't have Impressionism without colour, which is the force our next artist, Edouard Manet, stands for. Prepare to be colorized after the break. Welcome back. Impressionism is coming along now. Corbet and Manet are its two big precursors. Here are some paintings by Manet. Corbet's reality is his own sensuality. Manet's take on the sensual is color. Manet releases colour from being an add-on and makes it something in itself. Not only something, but the main thing. This is black, but its shape, its dominance, its relation to the other shapes means black is not just an absence, but a positive force. Manet never allows you to think, oh, it's a painting of so-and-so. He's always waking you up to how the component parts of a painting operate, how they work. Manet is high class. He's cool, not passionate. Posh, not from the country. He couldn't be more opposite to Corbet. To tell Manet's story, we have to go back to the 1860s when Napoleon III was still emperor. Manet's career only lasted 20 years, from the early 1860s to the early 1880s. In that time, Paris was modernized. It was completely transformed from a stinking load of winding medieval streets with a few staggering palaces rising up out of the muddle to a gleaming, streamlined, modern city. The rules of bourgeois life are set up in Manet's time. We still obey the main one now, which is that the compensation for never asking for true freedom and true happiness is great latherings of escapism and consumerism. This all started with Napoleon III in the 1860s. The emperor knows that he can't just aristocratically ignore the workers and the new rising bourgeoisie. He has to skillfully manipulate them and subtly oppress them instead. So as well as new architecture, new avenues and squares and new venues of grand spectacular events, like the brand new opera house, which is the great cultural achievement of the new regime, there's a new attitude as well, a new spirit, one of pleasurable consumerism, where you're encouraged to stop worrying about politics and learn to buy things and be entertained. Authoritarianism reigns, but is masked by economic prosperity, the look of progress, and new types of modern fun. the age of the arcades, newly built pleasure places, passages off the main streets where you can go and buy things, new consumer objects, new fashion gear. 
Manet is excited by the modern too, but he doesn't want it to be all lies. He thinks the truth of colour is the answer. The poet Baudelaire calls Manet the painter of modern life. Give us a sense of the beauty of the art of the past with the gods and so on in their robes, Baudelaire says, but give us vivid modernity instead of misty classicism. Show everyone how beautiful we are in our boots and cravats. That's exactly what Manny comes up with, the modern going by in a beautiful, luminous, transparent, liquid blur. What are you if you're a describer of the new, a flaneur? This is the French word meaning stroller that Baudelaire employed to describe a new modern sensibility that went with the new modern city. The flaneur goes around regarding modern life, keeping his distance, not getting involved. He's a voyeur as well as a flaneur. He's a sampler of experience at one remove. He's always smiling ironically above it all. Grey thinks our own contemporary trendy art world. That's exactly what we are. Really, how does irony work? In conversation, it's a mark of intelligence. It means being able to think of more than one thing at a time. For Manet, it's thinking about pictures and the stuff that pictures are made of. He can do both. This is Manet's portrait of the realist novelist Emile Zola. But it's also a painting about yellow and black. It's a fantastic visual object. This kind of thing influences our moment, but in a perverse way. The genius of our Turner Prize art is the way it pinpoints and vivifies our modern desire not for visually marvellous objects, but for ironic ideas that hover disembodied nearby to visually straightforward objects. It's 1862. Manet is 30. He's a dude and a dandy and a flaneur. Every day he strolls down to the Boulevard des Italiennes and lunches at the Café Totoni. And then in the afternoons he comes down to the gardens of the Tuileries Palace. The palace used to be over there. We're back now ten years before it gets burned down by rioting communards. And he does a lot of drawings. The gardens are full of the great and the good of the Paris world of the arts in the early 1860s. Poets, art critics, art writers, authors, heads of art galleries. Imagine them all milling here. Then he gets back to the Tortoni at five or six and receives compliments for the drawings as they pass from hand to hand. People like Baudelaire who encourage him. Back in the studio, based on the drawings, Manet puts together his first painting of modern life. It's called Music in the Tuileries Gardens. Here's the fleeting glance of the strolling dandy in the blur of the Tuileries. Modern entertainment goes on here. Outdoor concerts for the posh near the Emperor's Palace. On the extreme left is Manet, and then it's a monocled art writer. This weird shape is Baudelaire, a modern blur. He's persuading these other writers that art's sole purpose now is the creation of aesthetic experience. Corbet hates hearing stuff like that, but Manet agrees with it. He says, yes, aesthetic creation, but base it on what you see all around you. To that extent, he agrees with Corbet, but here's the departure, because then it's even more aesthetic. It's even more visually unpredictable and lively. The painter's superiority over the objects of his gaze. That's Manet's painterly version of dandyism. How does the painting work visually? A green spread against a spread of pinky orange. Black clothes of the men in a jumble through the orange. The line of black hats and the unreal seeming tree trunks cutting through the jumble. Then the accents of bright colour, blue, red and the greys, whites and creams and peaches. It was shown at a private gallery in Paris in March 1863. No one liked it. Couldn't he finish anything? Couldn't he draw? Manet 
strides through art history like a colossus. But at the time, he was just thought to be pretentious. He became an art shocker at a one-off art event called the Salon of the Refused. It's an official show of artists rejected by the Salon. Here are all their pathetic thrown-out canvases. Why show with a lot of rejects? In Manet's case, people thought it was to be deliberately scandalous. This is what a scandal looked like in 1863. The future Impressionists saw this, they recognised its power. It became an icon, it stood for change. Why though, when it looks like hardly anything to us now? A few unlikely poses, some arty nudity. We have to unpack its shock value in terms of what it was different to at the time. Salon art's polished illusions, its careful stagings of nudity. What does the salon audience want from art? It gets dressed up and it goes to see something morally elevated, not something disgusting. It doesn't want to see Tracy Emin's bed. It wants to see sexuality carefully contextualised in terms of what is known and accepted at the time. Goddesses and damsels in distress. White slaves, maybe, kidnapped by exotic Arab slave traders and made to live in harems. Instead, Manet does unmistakable modern sexuality. The painting is now known as the Déjeuner sur l'herbe, the picnic. The pose recalls classical goddesses in art by old masters like Titian. But the social activity it connects to is prostitution. Prostitutes were available for hire at a lot of locations all along the banks of the River Seine. Prostitution was naturally connected in anyone's mind with bathing in the Seine. Here is a woman bathing, and in fact the painting's original title when it was first shown was The Bath. You don't mention prostitution, you cover it up with prudery, but Manet's exposing it and connecting it to art. Manet is seen by his audience as a great assaulter of the old masters, but it's really only the dullness of the pseudo-old mastery of the salon that he's assaulting. Actual old master art he thinks is great. Titian is its god. He's competing with Titian on Titian's own painterly terms. The glow of the still life, the glow of the body, and the whole arrangement of those high colours within the greys and greens and blacks. He's modernising Titian up. Manet gets the overall setup, clothed men and nude women, from a painting by Titian. He gets the precise poses of the main figures from a Renaissance engraving after a painting by Raphael. Those people in the corner become Manet's people. In the Titian, there's no eye contact with the audience. Quite right, the audience feels. But with Manet, she's looking directly out at you, perfectly relaxed and cocky. And that's the attitude of the whole painting. Very wrong. But something worse was coming. The response to this painting, when it was shown in the salon two years after the Déjeuner sur l'herbe, was so furious, guards had to be posted to stop it being physically attacked. Its title is Olympia. Olympia is the kind of name high-class Parisian prostitutes sometimes took. So there's no doubting what the scene is. A prostitute receives a caller. But it's also a painting that looks at itself being a painting. Upfront modern sex is tied to a new rough, bold handling. That curtain is as much real brushstrokes as it is fabric. The real flowers here, the flower pattern here. She's not really a prostitute, she's a model, acting a part, which is actually what she has in common with the nudes and the old masters. They're not really goddesses either, because goddesses don't exist. Manet's model is Victorine Miron. She's his collaborator. She acts different types in an amazingly relaxed way. They're thought to have been lovers. He met her in the street. She was 17. He asked her to come by for modelling work. She agreed because she'd heard of him. She appears throughout Manet's paintings of the 1860s. Manet is assumed to be a sexy guy, always picking up women from 
high-class brothels and cafes were an extraordinarily complicated system of prostitutes and courtesans and kept women was available. His wife once surprised him following a woman in the street. Oh, I'm sorry, he said. I thought it was you. Manet did paint several portraits of his wife, but Victorine is his main model. She's got the look that initially draws the audience in. But then Manet refuses to draw it in any further with any intelligible meanings or with any surface polish. The audience is pushed away by the rough scrawling, the deliberate disconnections that seems to be all fragments. In fact, it's a unity of colour relationships. Who the personalities are, what the scenes are, isn't the point. The point is colours relating to other colours. Looking at his stuff on TV now, it's hard to think of it as unclear. It looks like art. But for his audience, it didn't look like art. And that's why they didn't like it. This one, the lunch in the studio, is really about making black glow. The black of that jacket. As a scene, it's kind of incoherent. Nobody looks at anybody else. They've all been assembled from different worlds. There are oysters ready to be eaten, and coffee is being served. But they'd never be in the room at the same time. Nobody knows who modelled for the maid. The man might be Manet. Actually, it isn't. The boy could be anyone. Actually, he's Manet's illegitimate son. glimpsed on the street, a random encounter. The white is the steam from the trains coming out of the Saint-Lazare station. Manet's studio overlooks the station. The white makes the black railings striking. The contrast of black and white seems to be the main meaning. There's no story offered. The title is just The Railway. It doesn't give anything away. Because of art scholarship, we do know something about the woman in the painting. It's Victorine Miron, Manet's old model. She walked out of his studio one afternoon in 1867 and disappeared for six years. It turned out she went to America. Now she's returned. In a few years, she'll be dead from alcoholism. But for Manet's purposes, none of these meanings behind the scenes matter. He just wants the visual object, its arresting power. Manet wanting to be visually striking sounds a bit tame compared to Corbet wanting to bring down the government. But Manet's visual freshness is profound, it says something. For Corbet, truth is peasant experience. For Manet, it's visual perception. The world isn't really perceived as a collection of polished details, but as a collection of glimpses of colour, patches and tone. Corbet's milieu in the 1850s was working-class bohemian. Manet's in the 1860s was middle-class bohemian. Impressionism is more or less a middle-class movement. Corbet went to anarchist beer cellar dives, but Manet went to more expensive joints. In the 1860s, when most of the artists who were to become the Impressionists already knew each other, they went to the Café Gaubois in the Rue de Batignol, now Avenue de Clichy. And now the Gaubois is a shoe shop instead of a café. To hear Manet talk about art. He lived in the same street at number 34, and he held meetings here every week. Cheers. Obviously, we hate the Impressionists being middle class. We think art should be edgy and a bit dangerous. The weird thing about Impressionism is that it was known to have come out of both Manet's and Courbet's examples. So it was thought to be both a revolutionary, menacing art and a relaxed, leisure type of art.
This is Manet's last major painting, a bar at the Folie Bergère. A dandy solicits a barmaid. There she is, there's the bar. Everything else is a mirror reflection. The model really did work at the Folie Bergère. Manet based the painting on sketches done on the spot and then he posed her back at the studio. A painter friend of Manet's modelled for the man. He got the painting into the Salon of 1882. He got a medal for it. The same year, he got the Legion of Honour. He wrote to the government to thank them and to the Salon jury for the medal. He said he was too ill to collect it and he wished he'd got it 20 years ago as it would have made his fortune. Manet knew he could never paint anything this ambitious again. His time was up. He was suffering the consequences of all his life, not only being Mr. Colour Man, but Mr. Lover Man. When he moved himself and his family here, 39 Rue de St. Petersburg, in 1878, he was already suffering from a nervous disorder, a late product of syphilitic illness he contracted when he was young. An experimental treatment was prescribed for Manet's illness, which turned out to be disastrous. It led to circulation problems in one of his legs and then to gangrene. The leg had to be amputated. And then on the 30th of April, 1883, aged only 51, in the upstairs apartment, suffering convulsions, Manet died. What matters in Manet's art is the sense of modern life conveyed in the liveliness of the painting. Other types of sense are no longer the business of painting. For this one to feel right, it doesn't matter that all sorts of logics are wrong. The bottles on the bar here should be reflected on the near side of that marble top and not the far side. The position of the man is where we are now looking at the painting. But we shouldn't be able to see his reflection because it will be blocked by her body. There's an audience above and one below. There's an aperitif bottle with Manet's signature on it. Remember, Manet is dying. The bottle is flame red. Maybe it's hell below. The flickering look of the surface is Manet being influenced by his influencees, the Impressionists. We thought we hadn't got there yet, but in fact, they're on the scene. In a minute, meet the big one, Claude Monet. The man who makes your eyes wobble. Welcome back. The main impressionist was Claude Monet. Reality, sensuality, colour. Monet's inheritance from Manet and Courbet. Rawness, directness, painting outdoors in nature. This is what Monet brings to the mix. It was Monet who founded the Impressionist group. There were about 12 members, but it was Monet who most stood for its main principles. Movement, spontaneity and light. Interestingly, Monet didn't go looking for Impressionism. He stumbled on it by accident. Here he is in his 20s. This is his story. He was a classic, out-of-control artist who would be embarrassed by if he behaved today like he did in the 19th century. He was born lower middle class in 1840 in Paris, but he was brought up on the coast in Normandy. His mother died when he was 17. As a teenager, he did caricatures of well-known locals and sold them, and he used his earnings to buy himself art lessons at cheap, little, shabby, private art schools. One of these, the Académie Suisse, was just near here on the Quai des Orfèvres on the city island in Paris. It was at the Suisse that Monet met Renoir. They went around together. They did a few portraits, Monet did a few more caricatures, and they lived on sacks of beans, Monet claimed later when he was rich and he wanted to sentimentalise the past. But it's true that he never did have any real money until he was in his late middle age. He would get money but squander it. He had expensive tastes and he put on airs. He would tell middle class women 
that he only slept with duchesses or serving girls. Anything in between, he said, would be revolting. As a young man, Monet's idea of success, like Manet's and Courbet's, was to get in the salon. Here is his portrait of Courbet, but it was because of Manet's influence that Monet thought colour was painting's road into the future. What type of colour, though? He copied dresses from illustrations in magazines. He thought about fashion colour as well as nature colour. He painted this two years after he saw Manet's Déjeuner sur l'herbe in the Salon of the Refused. He got Courbet to give him advice about it. Corbet's advice was to give it up because it was too big. He rolled up the enormous canvas and left it with a landlord in lieu of some rent that he owed. And when he came back years later, it was mostly destroyed by damp. These are just the fragments that remain. This one is called Four Figures in a Garden. Monet's lover, Camille Danseur, posed for all four of them. What is it? He's doing something which is very important in painting, but which is very rarely discussed outside the world of art criticism. He's doing something formal. Intuitively, bit by bit, he's making a style idea come to life. You can see that very vividly in the way he connects the brown hair of the woman with the patch of brown at the base of that tree. That's a purely visual connection. He's making wibbly edges connect. The edges of the foliage and the grass, the edges of the dresses, the edges of the flowers. He spots those flowers with white and he spots that dress with black. It's a very formal painting. He might not know he's doing something quite so formal. He might think he's coming at it completely naturally. But in that natural is the formal. Formal in an art context doesn't mean being polite or wearing smart clothes. It means visual power, visual noticeability. Monet thought he got this from painting outdoors. He always insisted he was an outdoors artist, painting direct from nature. Monet adored Manet. Manet knew about Monet, but he hated their names being similar, hated critics mistaking them for each other. He would never paint outdoors. He thought Monet was an idiot for doing so. But the outdoors obsession for Monet was his way of being like Manet. He thought he should follow where nature led. Maybe the way to get a synthesis of Manet and Courbet was to paint in the newly modernised outer suburbs. Formerly country villages, because of the way daily life was organized under the new emperor, they'd become weekend leisure resorts for Parisians. It was the done thing now to catch the train at the Saint-Lazare station in Paris and spend weekends at these semi-rural spots. There was a whole string of them on the recently set up rail network out to Rouen along the bends of the River Seine. Families could go for walks, go boating and have picnics, and single men could do all those things and pick up the local women. It's 1869 now. Monet worked out here with Renoir. Renoir was on his level, not a hero like Manet or Courbet, but a mate. They each wanted to paint a big salon scene of a floating restaurant. First, they thought they'd better do some fast oil sketches. Monet stood here with his easel and Renoir stood a few yards down there. And they both looked out there into the middle of the Seine, where now there is only the Seine. But where there used to be the floating restaurant with a lot of people dressed up or else in their 19th century bathing costumes swimming. This is one of Monet's oil sketches of the scene. It's called La Grenouillère. That's the nickname of the time for this bathing place. It means the froggies, the prostitutes of the area who swam in the river. In Renoir's oil sketch, you see the individuality of the modern clothes and styles. 
the difference between one outfit and another. But with the Monet, there's much less to write a social significance thesis about. Some people in the water and some silhouette figures here. They painted quicker than it takes me to finish this sentence. Here's another of Monet's sketches. Remember, these sketches were for a larger painting. Monet thought they were stepping stones toward the real thing. But then he realized this was the real thing. This was the Impressionist style. The looseness that he was planning to tighten up in the big painting, this was the good thing. The real now is light effects alone. Nothing politically aggressive or sexually risque has to be in the scene as well to show that there's a challenge going on. Monet is making how a picture works be the exciting thing, not what it's a picture of. Physical stuff and its changing, jostling, busy relating, one bit against another, everywhere, is now the beginning and the ending. The only thing. Impressionism. The moment. We're here. What's the main thing to say about it? Well, it's the only modern art movement that most ordinary people have heard of and quite like. There is something holiday-like about it. For that reason, it's a horror style for today's officially approved avant-garde. It's considered not serious enough. That's because it seems optimistic, and being optimistic seems naive. I believe that's a misconception, though. All Monet thinks about is colour values. He stares at colour till his eyes pop out. Partly it makes sense because of the pressure on painting from photography. Photography was invented in the 1830s. It's been going now for 40 years. It shows a world a bit like Impressionism. It shows it as it really is, light hitting objects. Impressionism is inspired by photography but also it challenges photography. It wants to be scientific, but at the same time emotional, full of feeling. It shows a world aesthetically heightened. You feel heightened just looking at it. That's because this isn't really how the world is, but an idealized version of the world, an intensified world. In 1871, Monet dodged both France's war with Prussia and the Paris Commune by going away to live abroad. Then he came back to Paris and lived with his wife Camille and their young son Jean in Argenteuil, another suburban leisure place. Today, Argenteuil is a bit of a dump. In Monet's time, it was just beginning to be industrialized, but it was pretty. All this used to be poppy fields. Living out here for six years, Monet keeps evoking light and atmosphere through nuances of colour and touch. That grotty house I was just standing by beside a car park is what remains of this house at the back of a poppy field in an image of Impressionism that we know from a million posters on bedroom walls. It's not the real beauty of Argentoy in the 1870s he's capturing here. The poppy field is the taking off point for a colour arrangement. The blue in the parasol repeats the blue in the sky. He's making everything tie together on the terms of the painterly language that he's using. He doesn't bother to make this mother and child different to that mother and child. Both sets are Camille and Jean, just put in different parts of the same painting. Hang on, what happened to the salon? It's still the only show in town. As an artist, you can't do anything else but be in it. But Monet says, let's do something else. Artists with attitude, get the train back to my place. Monet's house in Argentoy. In December 1873, Renoir, Degas, Monet and a few others all gather in Monet's front room here. And they officially form their own independent group, the Anonymous Society of Artists. 
The Impressionist style exists, but now the movement is about to go public, then to history. Both Courbet and Manet blatantly challenged the establishment before the Impressionists, but they still strive to be accepted by the Salon. When the Impressionists made their breakaway move in 1873, it was the beginning of the end of the Salon's power. And then the following year, 1874, in April, the first Impressionist show opened in Paris. A few minutes walk from the studio of Edouard Manet at number 35, Boulevard des Capucines. It was on the second floor in the studio of a famous photographer, Felix Nadar. Photography is modern, the idea of the show is modern, and the actual building is modern, because this whole street has only just been built as part of Paris's modernization. There are 39 artists in the show and 165 works. There's no jury, you just have to pay a subscription of 60 francs and you can put your paintings in. There are 12 real impressionists, plus a load of tame, slightly loser artists who also can't get their works into the salon every year. The show lasts one month, it costs a franc to get in, the same as it costs to get into the salon. Half a million people visit the salon every year, about 3,000 come to this exhibition. The newspapers say it's slovenly and subversive, and just like the filthy commune all over again. The Impressionists lose money on the show, but they don't lose hearts. They decide to have one every year from now on. A journalist writing on a funny review called Charivari, a little bit like Private Eye, notices a painting by Monet in the show called Impression Sunrise. And he writes a hilarious account about an imaginary visitor to the exhibition who's driven insane by all the impressions. And that's how the name comes about, Impressionism. It's an insult, and then it's a badge of honor. Here is that painting, Impression Sunrise. Thin washes, intense color, thick orange and white, making sunlight at dawn. Did politics just evaporate then? Personally, I think Impressionism is political, but in a deep way. It wasn't that the Impressionists were disillusioned by politics because of the defeat of the Commune, so they turned to an art of pointless pleasure in loveliness. I think they responded to a major social change by radically modifying the relationship between society and art. They made a kind of art that deliberately opposed society's values. From the perspective of today's official art world, it's art's duty to question widely accepted values. That's why anyone in the art world today questions Impressionism, because it's widely liked. Ironically, it's Impressionism that first kicks off this questioning attitude in art. Also ironically, today's new art is officially supported, whereas Impressionism for many years was officially despised. There's a parallel with money. Getting high prices is a measure of an artist's status today. They're not really thought to be artists unless there's big money on the scene. But for many years, apart from a few isolated periods, Impressionism was commercially worthless. One period of financial success was just before the first Impressionist exhibition. In 1872, Monet completed a painting a week. He sold a whole batch of them to a single buyer for 10,000 francs. The next year, he sold much more to the same guy for twice as much. A labourer earned about 2,000 francs a year, a doctor or a lawyer about 12,000. So making 20,000 put Monet in a very high income bracket, something like an advertising guy or a media guy or a Turner Prize level artist today. But the money wasn't regular, it came in stops and starts, and money was always spending, so he was always broke. Monet had a specially rigged up studio boat that enabled him to observe the play of light on water at close hand. He slept on the boat and made trips round the large S-bends of the Seine. You are the Raphael of water, Manet told him. In reply, Monet, who a modern person might think should really have had counselling to learn how to take responsibility for himself, wrote Manet a letter in June 1873. 
I have no more credit with the butcher or baker. Could you not send me by return mail a 20 franc note? Welcome back. An everyday tale of Impressionist folk. In 1874, the year of the first Impressionist show, an economic depression hits France. The Impressionists believe it will soon be over. They are wrong. It gets worse and worse. The big slump coincided with a big complication in Monet's love life. This is the Chateau de Rottenbourg at Montgeron on the outskirts of Paris. It's owned by Alice Oshed, who's a wealthy Belgian aristocrat. Her husband, Ernst, owns a lot of Impressionist paintings. They want Monet to decorate the interior of the chateau, and this painting is one of his decorations. Turkeys in one of the chateau's fields. Monet stayed here eight months. He left Camille and Jean in Argenteuil. It's likely that Monet's affair with Alice Oshed began now. The following year, Ernst Oshed goes bankrupt. He tries to commit suicide. He fails at that and runs away to Belgium. Monet's not selling anything. His family's virtually starving. He meets Alice in Paris. He tells her he's taking Camille and Jean out to a distant suburb where it'll be cheap to live. Alice says she'll join him with Ernst and the children. She's just had another baby, a six one. Maybe Monet is the father. This is where they lived, the village of Vettoy. Monet and Camille and their son and the whole Oshed family moved here in December 1878. Winter comes. Camille tries to have an abortion, but something goes wrong. The next year she gives birth but falls ill from the after effects of the botched abortion. And then in September 1879, age 32, Camille dies. Monet is devastated. They've been together for 12 years. He sees her lying on the bed, the corpse changing colour. I couldn't resist it, he said. I had to capture it as she turned blue. Camille is only brushstrokes now. She and Alice and Monet and Ernst. That complicated drama is now going to simplify. Here's the house where, first of all, two families live. Now it's one family with Monet and Alice set up together as man and wife. Only they're not really married, which makes the neighbours look down their noses at them. They soon changed their tune though when Monet started driving around in a Rolls Royce with a chauffeur and earning 200,000 francs a year. His rise to millionairedom was caused by the successful promotion of Impressionism in America by art dealers. This was in the 1880s. Monet went from broke to those days equivalent of top of the rich list because of the dealer's business sense combined with his self-promotion. It was like his brief period of commercial success ten years ago in the early 70s. Only now he controlled success and this time it was going to last. He allied himself with different art dealers and set them against each other in order to drive up his prices. He painted scenes in sets to give his exhibitions a unified theme. He painted series, a series of Rouen cathedrals, a series of haystacks at different times of the day in different lights. American millionaires would buy the lot. He arranged for positive profiles of himself to appear in the newspapers before the exhibition opened rather than after it closed. A strategy that now appears standard behaviour to anyone in the art world, but it was Monet who first set up a lot of what we now think of as standard in art. Monet's paintings of Rouen Cathedral at different times of the day, they're well known. How good are they? Some are better than others. There's a constancy in Monet which produces both his good paintings and the bad ones. And what goes wrong with the bad ones is that close tonality can be slightly boring as well as exciting. Frankly, this surface is more exciting than this one. His story is all about the triumph of Impressionism, but it's only seen as that now. In the 1910s and 20s, 
It was sought by rich people to decorate their rooms and even by the government to decorate new official museums. But the general public went on disliking it because it was too gaseous and abstract. While new cutting edge modern artists disliked it too because it wasn't abstract enough. The stuff that drew the slaggings off and the eager buyers in equal measure was this kind of thing. Scenes of water lilies that Monet began doing at the end of the 19th century. They're based on a carefully controlled reality, a garden environment Monet created himself. This is the most famous garden in art history. This is where Monet was living when he was having all his success. His place in Giverny, 40 miles from Paris, a little way along from Vatoy on the road to Rouen. Monet came here in 1883 with Alice and the children when he was 42. He had 44 more years to live. He spent them all here. Over the years, he became a grand figure, visited constantly by high society and people in politics. This is actually the French Prime Minister with him now. He puts on dinners, he has himself photographed and filmed and interviewed, and he accepts a role as a kind of art god, which today's popular audience for art is still willing to give him. This used to be a studio where Monet painted his profoundest stuff, gigantic panoramic water lily paintings. Now it's an outrageously commercial, gigantic Monet souvenir shop. Key rings, jigsaw puzzles, calendars, Monet writing paper, Monet cookbooks, None of it can convey Monet's amazing ability to make the physical stuff of paint come alive. That paint is an equivalent to reality, but this Monet mouse mat is a poor equivalent to that paint. He had the studio built in order to create a group of paintings to be donated to the French government, a kind of Monet environment. Working on them, he sometimes heard ammunition trains going by on the railway to Rouen. Sometimes he heard artillery firing beyond the studio. It's 1917 now, and the First World War has been going on for three years. Monet is completely cut off from it. Monet was the main impressionist and also the purist. He controlled the impressionist brand he identified himself with it. With his water lilies in his old age, he took the style out to its furthest extreme of pure floating atmospheric shimmer. The theme of Monet's water lily paintings is to be frankly decorative. Decorative is a dirty word in art today. It's like the plague. It kills whatever it touches. It kills it with shallowness, which we know to be bad. Shallowness it's confusing here, though. There really is no other meaning than what you're seeing. What are you seeing? A surface. The surface of the pond is a mirror to the sky. No actual sky, just reflections of blue broken up by reflections of trees and blasts of light. That characteristic no colour that you get when light hits water. And then there's the surface of paint. Those amazing strokes doing their stroke thing. Every touch and scrawl and blip of colour, bringing to life every other touch and scrawl. So the whole thing seems to be constantly moving, constantly changing, like the thing that Monet is depicting. Only you get the feeling that the idea of the water lily pond is just an excuse for all this. It is asking you to get into it purely visually, to see it as nothing but itself.
This isn't the end of the Impressionism story. Some much more bizarre tales are still to come, but it is the end of Impressionism's absolutely pure phase. The story now closes in around its hero, Monet, with his visual supersensitivity excluding himself from the world, not noticing that the First World War was going on just beyond his garden. When Monet died at home in his bed in Giverny in 1926, aged 86, he'd been out of fashion for years. He sold to millionaires. He was a millionaire himself, but his type of visually delightful, drifting beauty no longer fitted with avant-gardism. Cubism had been invented by Picasso and Braque. In fact, it had been around for 20 years. Picasso didn't like Monet's art and ignored it, so all the other modern art-isms after Cubism ignored it too. Surrealism was the big one now, a totally non-beauty movement. Then Monet came back into fashion in the 1950s when New York abstract expressionism came in. He seemed to fit that, and from that boost his reputation rose in a kind of awkward, staggered ascent in which abstract expressionism goes out of intellectual fashion, so Monet is forgotten again by art people, but because of the rise of the culture industry, he's loved by ordinary people. To his present position, where he's the most popular artist in the world, a total blockbuster, adored because of the Monet lifestyle, rather than for what actually makes his paintings tick. People now go to blockbuster shows of Monet, and they think, hey, what's wrong with being superficial? Why get involved with difficulty? I don't know. How is that wrong exactly? Impressionism is a much more fraught and complicated movement in art than we perhaps usually realise. It's a constant problem in modern art with what was once vivid and urgent becoming anodyne. Difficulty is an antidote to blandness. Maybe that's more like it. It certainly leads naturally to the last artist in our programme. Paul Cezanne had an absolutely difficult personality. Sullen, full of tantrums, smelly, afraid of women, couldn't bear it if they touched him, if they just brushed by. A fanatic Catholic, obsessive, solitary, right-wing and paranoid. Enter the tortured but incredibly beautiful world of Cezanne after the break. Hello, welcome back. Cezanne is the Impressionist who takes Impressionism into modern art. He takes the spontaneity and movement of Monet and puts in structure. He slows Impressionism down. He puts cerebral difficulty in with sensual pleasure. It was Picasso who looked back at Cezanne and said, it wasn't Cezanne's apples, but Cezanne's anxiety that was the thing. So Cezanne is an absolute blue-chip nicest, but he's already giving you a bit of nasty in with his nice. When he was young, he was a much more horrible artist. He did psycho murder scenes like this. Impressionism liberated him from his own inner storms. In art, he could control his emotions, in life, he couldn't. Cezanne came from the town of Aix-en-Provence in the south of France. He was born in 1839 in this street, Rue de l'Opéra. When he was young, he hated his family. He feared his father. His father was uneducated but wealthy. He'd been a hat maker, made money, and then became co-boss of a successful bank. When Cezanne was 21, he painted his father in his early, marvellously grim style. His father passed on to Cezanne his own anxious, obsessive personality. The father agonised that he wasn't taken seriously by polite society because he was a self-made man and because he only married the mother of his three children after they were all born. Cezanne was illegitimate. Cezanne's youthful love object was Emile Zola. They were at school together in X. They both loved art and literature. They were both clever, 
They went on walks and swims together in the Provence countryside. They read each other their verses. Zola became the great realist novelist. He encouraged Cezanne, who was much braver than Cezanne. He didn't have a tyrannical father. The father wanted Cezanne to be a lawyer. Cezanne wanted to be an artist. The father finally gave in, so long as he could keep a neurotic control over his son's every movement. Cezanne lived in a hell of the mind. In fact, his first home when he lived in Paris was here in Rue d'Enfer, Hell Street. His father set him up in a room in this house. He signed on at a cheap art class, the Academy Glay, where he met Monet and the future Impressionists. He kept trying to get accepted by the Grand Academy of Fine Art, but he kept failing. So he slunk back to X and worked in his father's bank. What are you doing, said Zola? Get back to Paris. So he came back to the Rue d'Enfer. And this was the beginning of the double life that he was to lead for year after year partly in Paris, partly in X, and miserable in both. Every year he sent paintings to the Salon, which every year rejected them. He tried to shock everyone, the Salon, the Impressionists. He got in a shock rut. The Impressionists would be at whatever hangout Manet was at in order to be near the great star. Cezanne would sit in an imploded, unwashed heap, furiously shy, and then suddenly blurt out a bit of bonhomie shattering rudeness. He once said to Manet, I won't shake your hand, Monsieur Manet. I haven't washed for eight days. Another time, Manet politely asked Cezanne what he was preparing for that year's salon. And Cezanne replied, I'm preparing a load of merde. Interesting integrity, you probably think. Sounds good. But you can imagine how tedious it probably was to have to encounter it in real life and how you might want to avoid it and maybe see his paintings in a certain light. The weird, nightmarish things he was trying unsuccessfully at this time to get accepted by the Salon. This is one of Cezanne's takes on Manet's Déjeuner sur l'herbe, a paradise of naked women surrounding Cezanne. All our other artists in this programme had sensational love lives. Cezanne never had any love at all and remained a virgin until 1869 when he was 30, when he began an affair with the model Hortense Fiquet. They had a son also called Paul. It was him, Hortense and Paul all surviving on his allowance from his father, which he knew would be cut off if his father ever found out he had a family. Eighteen seventy one sees the war with Prussia and the Commune. Cezanne's a draft dodger hiding out here in Provence. After all the burning and bloodshed in Paris, the painter Lucien Pissarro invited Cezanne to paint with him in the Paris suburbs. Pissarro on the right, Cezanne on the left. They're about to set out on a painting trip. They look sturdy and workmanlike. It was from Pizarro that Cezanne learned Impressionism. With that, the violent mood inside stayed inside, while on canvas, Cezanne started to produce something much more slow-burning. April 1874, the first Impressionist show. Invited by Monet to take part, Cezanne pays his 60 francs subscription and amongst the works he puts in, he includes this parody of Manet. It's called A Modern Olympia. The prostitute's client is painted in. It's Cezanne with his bald head, but wearing the dandy outfit that Manet was always photographed in. Clothes that Cezanne would never wear. Black frock coat and cane, and on the chaise longue, the aristocratic top hat. Cezanne draws attention to himself by identifying himself with a scandalous figure, Manet. At the same time, he mocks Manet and he mocks himself. A therapist today would say it's a cry for help. Manet thinks it's rubbish. He can't bear Cezanne. One of the reasons he won't be in the first Impressionist show is Cezanne. Degas can't bear him either. No one likes him. What's the problem? Trouble at home? This is the Just de Buffon, 
the Cezanne family estate just outside of X. Cezanne paints at the Jass. That's the top floor room his father had converted into a studio for him. That's good. What's bad is domestic life here, which is intolerable. It's all based on his father's complete irrationalism. In 1878, when Cezanne's nearly 30, his father opens a letter to him from one of the Impressionist buyers. In it, he learns that not only does Cezanne have a lover, but also a son. He decides that when Cezanne goes to Paris, he keeps several women in rooms there. He fights with Cezanne and temporarily cuts down his allowance. But years later, when Cezanne's father has a flirtation with one of the maids at the Jacques de Buffon, he temporarily increases his allowance. In 1886, Cezanne is nearly 50, but still in that year, his mother and sister and his father, who's now nearly 90, are able to pressurise Cezanne for the sake of respectability to finally marry Hortense. The wedding takes place. It's a bleak event because they don't love each other. A few months later, Cezanne's father dies and Cezanne becomes a wealthy man from the inheritance. Cezanne is now the boss of the jazz. But instead of this cheering him up, he becomes convinced that his own death is drawing near and that all human interaction is futile. He lives here with his mother and sister running the household. He quite likes them, but on the whole, nobody in this family likes each other. Hortense does endless modeling sessions for Cezanne, but they have nothing in common. She hates his mother and sister. His mother and sister hate each other and hate her. She spends as much time as she can away from X living in Paris with her and Cezanne's son, who's now a teenager. All the connections in this human tangle tend to be negative, suspicion and paranoia. Renoir once came down to stay at the Jazz during this period, but he had to leave early, he said, because of the black avarice that reigns here. What's happening with his paintings? Well, we've reached the real Cezanne style, mature Cezanne, this titanic figure in art history. How do you make modern art that is, at the same time, like the old masters, that holds together and has an impact for the ages, not just for the moment? That's the aim. Will he achieve it? That's the question. He doesn't know. He's always racked with doubts. This is a portrait of Hortense from the 1880s. Here's another from the same time. She's hardly there in either as a personality, but both are still very moving emotionally. It's because of the tenderness. It's a dissociated thing. One state makes up for another. The schematic, anonymous cipher of a figure, emotionless. The loose paint, nuanced, melting, delicate, tender, conveying emotion instead. It's still Impressionism, but in a way that's solid as well as atmospheric. It's a mixture of Monet's darting observant alertness to light and colour in nature, Manet's patterned arrangements, Courbet's roughness and frankness with the physical stuff of paint. A mixture of all that into a slowly built up, carefully ordered arrangement. His art is composed and ordered, but he's even more eccentric than when he was young. He's a rebel against anything established, but he suddenly becomes a devout Catholic. He goes to the Mass every Sunday at the cathedral, pays careful attention to every word of the sermon, and has his chains ready for the beggars outside. He says, I want to share in what it was like to be in the Middle Ages. His painting is the most revolutionary type of art there's ever been, but he suddenly becomes politically conservative. He won't tolerate any left-wing views being expressed, even if it's people who support his art and the work of the artists that he used to like. He says the supporters of Impressionism are only intellectuals, a type he can't stand. He can't stand anyone who's only clever. He spends years being driven mad by not getting any success, and then when he gets it, it drives him mad too. In 1886, one of the dealers of the Impressionists puts on a show of Cezanne in Paris.
A few of the paintings sell to writers and poets. Degas and Renoir draw lots to see who will get the best still lives. And now there's a stream of articles in the papers. The former idiotic shocker has become a cult figure. It's a tiny cult, only artists and a few writers. The general audience still thinks Cezanne is mad. Meanwhile, the cultists go on pilgrimages to X to watch him work, to work with him and bring back reports of his conversations. He tells them he's looking at Poussin. Here's a picture by Poussin. He's a classicist from the 17th century. He paints idealized scenes of nature. They have biblical meanings or meanings from classical culture. In Cezanne's time, salon art pays a false homage to this kind of thing, trivializing its greatness with salon sweetness. The salon hates Cezanne, but Cezanne wants to do something that really will connect the high Renaissance tradition of creating a marvelous illusion of reality done wholly in the studio using old master trickery. He wants to connect that with the sensations he experiences out in the marvelous raw reality of nature. I want to redo Impressionism after Poussin, he says, or redo Poussin after nature. It comes to the same thing. Cezanne's interest in Poussin is an interest in solidity. Courbet, who Cezanne also admires, is interested in that too. But for Cezanne, who has the lesson of Monet as well as Courbet, solidity must be connected to its opposite. The fleeting, the fugitive, the changeable and the ephemeral. Solidity in Cezanne is the result of a patchwork of painterly equivalents for Cezanne sensations. The richness is that each unit is abstract. That means being real is connected to being abstract. This sounds confusing because we're used to thinking of reality as something out there that's opposed to ideas. In fact, reality is an idea. We don't know what's out there. We're always coming up with different ideas for it. Cezanne is building scenes based on feeling, observation, and the material stuff that he's working with, the canvas, the paint. How can he get all this to be powerful, to hold together? That's why there's transparency in Cezanne as well as solidity. His still lives are so obviously artificially posed, so concocted. He doesn't hide how they're constructed, he lets the seams show. Jars and fruits and tables and tablecloths are tipped up or angled in an unreal way. He actually balanced the objects on upturned coins or used artificial fruit instead of real ones. The scale of things is unreal. A pear is impossibly huge or impossibly small. This is the idea now that in the effort to be real, art will always be an invention, constructed, new from nothing. Cezanne did about 200 paintings of bathers. They range from small like this to very large. In art now, we've got used to mysteries being explained by a lot of mysterious chat, so they're not really explained at all. And we forget why we were interested in the first place. So we're used to not seriously questioning art anymore. It seems almost embarrassing to have to ask just why are there distortions in Cezanne? The answer is that the contours of objects are pressurized by a sense of pattern or design that builds up as Cezanne is working. They're not distorted because Cezanne is mad, which he wasn't, or because he's obsessive or anxious, which he certainly was, but because of the demands of the painting. He sees that it gets better as a painting if the contours keep getting reworked, as he keeps refinding the rhythm of the painting, refinding the structure and the order.
This makes sense as patches. They have a pictorial logic and beauty. It's an abstract logic. The figures become so distorted they're like trolls. The feeling is that the painting's real beauty is abstract, like a parallel world. Cezanne's models for the bathers' paintings are early drawings he'd done as an art student, or else photos he'd acquired, or drawings of old masters in the Louvre that he saw on his regular trips back to Paris. They were entirely products of his imagination. He never did them from real people. He'd stand for hours at the Louvre with Michelangelo's slaves, drawing them, and then he'd go back to the studio and process the results into his bathers' paintings or he'd go upstairs and draw a nude by Rubens. Anything voluptuous, as long as it wasn't actually breathing. Why not have the lovely live models in the studio? After all, he could afford it. He said to Renoir, women models frighten me. The sluts, they're always watching you, trying to catch off your guard. The end of the 19th century. Manet and Courbet are long dead, Monet is a millionaire, Cezanne has to sell the Jas de Buffon for legal reasons. He buys land just outside Aix and has a studio built on it. He paints there but lives in a little flat in town. Every day, more or less, for the last four years of his life, Cezanne left his flat in X and came to the studio at the top of these stairs. He then worked for the rest of the day, either in the studio or in the countryside surrounding it. The first session of the day's work began at six in the morning and went through without a break until 10.30. He has lunch at 11, works through for the rest of the day and then walks back to town, has dinner, and sleeps in his flat in the Rue Boulegon. He never dated his paintings or titled them, or in most cases signed them. He just worked on them and left them lying around in fields and came back later for them, if you remembered. One day he's out painting a few hundred yards from the studio and he gets caught in a storm. He already has bronchitis, diabetes, he's weak, he's old beyond his 66 years. He continues to work and then soaked to the skin, he collapses. He's found there a few hours later by some men who return him on the back of a laundry cart to his flat in X. He's got pneumonia. He's bedridden for 10 days. There's only him and the housekeeper in the place and the doctor. Hortense and Paul are in Paris. The housekeeper sends them a telegram, but they arrive too late. And Cezanne dies alone upstairs in this house seven in the morning on the 23rd of October 1906. What we're offered with Cezanne is anxious restlessness, forever trying to achieve an aim, as opposed to with Monet, a confident celebration of something fantastic or with Manet, a suave, intelligent picture of modern life, or Courbet, a solid picture of ordinary life. I cannot attain the intensity that unfolds before me, Cezanne wrote. All the ideas of the other artists flow into what Cezanne does, but it's Cezanne's difficulty that sticks for modern art. It becomes the fuel for all modern art's future developments. So, the two hours are nearly over. The Impressionists were all dead before Impressionism became truly popular. Now it's so loved, it seems too easy. Habit, familiarity, being saturated with Impressionism, these all make us not really see Impressionism. Then when it's woken up for us, its intensity is a challenge. Successful, trendy art today refers to the aggressive relationship to the audience that art, in following Impressionism's lead, always had. It does that referring 
even though the art world now is no longer thought of as a place of genuine rebellion. We have sanctified rebellion instead. What you gain from today's type of avant-gardism, a type of art that says you don't have to have anything visually sophisticated, you don't have to be an seat to get it, you don't have to cock your head on one side and squint and marvel at a bit of green next to a bit of blue. What you gain is pop glamour. The popular avant-gardist circus of now is a magic act, even more so when you have the illusion that you could do it yourself, whether it's pop death or pop politics. It's about creativity and invention in a kind of jokey, sloganizing relationship to what the genuine avant-garde of the past has left us. What you lose is the richness that makes Impressionism's niceness not superficial and therefore something that can easily be dispensed with, but profound. So that's the challenge of this art of the nice. The amusing, institutionalized insincerity of today's art versus Impressionism's blazing candor. Making a structure and analyzing the making of a structure. Waking you up to pleasure, how it works, to the meaning of pleasure. I think that's everything that art can do. Good night.